earth is the marketplace Go to the market work and dedication that you've put in now going into our fifth year of the Black Sustainability Summit. So I just want to give it up to you, sis, for the hard work and dedication. And uh, in the spirit of doing things appropriately based upon the traditions that I follow, which are Afrocentric traditions, I'm going to call on Mama Shirley Sherrod, if you could please just may I have your permission to continue speaking. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Give thanks. Give thanks. So. Uh, as you all heard, today we're going to be talking about saving, protecting, and reviving Black land. And I mean, it is such an apropos subject to be dealing with at this moment in time. We are going through what some would call one of the worst pandemics we've experienced in our modern history. And we know that owning Black land, I'm going to say, has probably been one of the pandemics that does not get discussed with regards to how we've had to acquire land, hold land, some of us have even lost land, unfortunately. And so this panel uh, really comprises to me some of the uh, nation's greatest subject matter experts on how to really rectify that problem. So we're gonna be talking about practical strategies to revive the land, avoiding pitfalls, and even sharing land management practices. Uh, if you are someone who has land in your family, it's been passed down and you have no idea what to do with it. Or if you're interested in creating a farm, a homestead, an off-grid community, or you just simply want to learn, then this panel is speaking directly to you. Uh, I'm just going to quickly state who they are, but I'm going to let them really go in depth and talk about their history. Uh, you've already heard me mention her name. We have here, uh, I call her Mama Shirley. That is Miss Shirley <laughs> Sherrod. Uh, both she and her husband, Charles Sherrod, founded New Communities Land Trust, as well as the Southwest Georgia Project, and they are based out of Albany, Georgia. Uh, she is also the author of The Courage to Hope. So that is a book that I feel is essential readings for you all to pick up. And today she's going to be talking about some of the political, political considerations of owning land. Uh, we also have Mr. Frank Taylor, as well as Tiari Todman of the Winston County Self Self-Help Cooperative based out of Louisville, Mississippi, the real Louisville. <laughs> and uh, they are going to be talking about the legal considerations of owning tracts of land and some of the details around that subject. We also have with us out of Eufaula, Alabama, the one and only Russell and Jewel Bean. They represent not only the one and only Tuskegee University, but they also represent their own entity, that being SMB Farm. And they're gonna be talking about some of the resource considerations of owning land, along with getting heirs on one accord about the land. Let's just let that settle for a second. <laughs> getting us all on one accord. I can't wait to hear what they're gonna share with us on that subject. And last but not least, we have the one and only Baba Rashid Nouri, the founder of Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture, as well as now the Nouri Group. He is based out of Atlanta, Georgia. He is also the author of Growing Out Loud, The Journey of a Food Revolutionary. And he is gonna be talking about uh, a very grand idea, but one that I think is practical, and we're gonna help him really dissect that for us. That is a new Homestead Act for the modern day rural and urban farming landscapes. So I've said a mouthful already. I'm going to sit back and let them kind of dive deeper into who they are and why they're here today. And we're going to start in the order of the names that I've mentioned, beginning with you, Miss Mrs. Shirley Shiraj. You can take Good it afternoon. It's really great to have this opportunity to share. You know, I've been at this a long, long time. Uh, I grew up on a farm and I knew what it felt like to be a landowner at an early age. And I saw what it meant to our family. You know, that land provided the means for having, for actually going to college. And, and sadly, many, <laughs> once that happened, not many of them decided to come back to farm. But my father was one of those who continued to do that. Now, he was murdered 55 years ago by a white farmer and I made the decision on the night of his death to stay in the South and vote my, devote my life to working for change. So that work, if you're gonna work, if you, if you plan to organize in the rural area, you will work with farmers. <laughs> There's lots of other work to be done in those areas, but that's how, you know, that's something I knew a lot about at, at an early age. And that's something I really wanted to work on. So I started, 
organizing cooperatives and 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 uh, doing other work with ASCS committees. They all a lot of the names changed during reorganization of USDA, but um, really trying to see how we could hold on to the land. But that civil rights work we were doing meant that a lot of people who lived on land owned by white farmers um, would be kicked off the land if they participated in the movement. And that prompted us during the summer of 1968 to send seven of our people to Israel to look at how Israel was resettling its people. So looking at the kibbutz, um, and we gathered lots of other information so that we started meeting and created new communities, the first community land trust in this country. And the goal was to set up an independent structure to buy, hold, and lease land. We, our, our, our vision was much bigger than just one piece of land in the county, but we, we started out uh, getting an option on 6,000 acres of land. I can remember feeling so free, you know, here we have a chance to plan. We could plan communities. We could plan what kind of educational system, what kind of health system, where industry would be located. We could plan what kind of farming. And we also planned how we would work with each other. We wouldn't use all of the traditional ways of doing that. I, I was young and just didn't feel that anybody would attack you and try to stop you when you were not asking them for anything, you're trying to build and, and help your own people. But that's exactly what happened. You know, they came at it, they, when, when they, they were dealing with us politically, you know, you end up with um, zoning issues, you end up with um, issues um, around, um, funds you could uh, access from the government. There was something called OEO then, the Office of Economic App, uh, Opportunity. And in uh, North Carolina, Seoul City was coming up around the same time. So these new, the, the government was, was set to support this work. They gave us a planning grant. We planned the whole 6,000 acres, everything that would happen there. The white folks locally, uh, got together to fight it at the state level. Lester Maddox was governor of the state of Georgia. He vetoed all federal money coming into the state to our project. They would shoot at our building some. We faced foreclosure. We started farming. They would dilute our fertilizer. You know, just anything they could do to keep us from being successful. They saw us as a threat. If you look at that county where it's located, Back in the 60s, the black population was 67 to 70%. Today, that the population of Lee County, Georgia is 15% black. They had chosen Lee County as that place for white people. So all of the black flight, I mean, the white flight from Albany has gone just across the line into Lee County. They, everything good is in Lee County today. So, you know, as you begin to build, these are things you, you have to plan for as you're planning the activities. Um, you gotta get good lawyers. Uh, you gotta get good sound advice from anyone you can find to help you with your cause because you will face opposition. Local people, even your own people, will see it as a threat because they assume you're going to move a lot of folks in there and all of a sudden there'll be more people there um, than, than compared to the percentages of the rest of the population and they feel the threat is that you will come in and turn and get people elected to office or get people in place um, so that you actually take over what happens there. That's part of the threat that you will uh, encounter. So I'll stop there because I don't want to take up all of the time and let others talk. <laughs> no, thank you, Mama. You, you've definitely uh, laid the batter. You know, we're getting ready to bake this cake and you just laid the batter thick. <laughs> so we appreciate that indeed. Uh, Frank and Tiari, I want you all to introduce yourself and just give a little quick history about Winston County Self-Help Cooperative and the works that you all do down there in Mississippi. Okay, I'm Frank Taylor. I am with the Winston County Self-Help Cooperative and I'd like to thank you, Shirley, 
for following you. I've been following you since 1989 when I met you. Oh, wow. So this kind of took that's been in business for 35 years. And our essential goal is to help save all America. And uh, in the same voice that Shirley stated that we're doing here uh, in Mississippi, uh, I left and went to college and I had no idea that I'd be returning back to Mississippi to be a part of this movement, but I'm very fortunate and I want to thank uh, Shirley and the the Federation of Southern Guard will allow me to be a part of that. Our family farm, I had an opportunity to purchase our family farm, which has been our family since 1877. And it's my goal, ultimate goal, to pass this on and to be in perpetuity. I hear T often regular when I come back 200 years later, it should be there. So from that point, I'm going to allow her to introduce herself and talk more about the one second. Good day, y'all. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Mama Shirley. I, I truly enjoyed your background and your story. I, I've been following you um, for some uh, for a while as well. Not since '89, but um, in the late 2000s. Um, again, like my dad said, we are here to help save rural America. Our goal is to ensure that communities are well equipped with the information that they need to either maintain their land, contain their health, um, also pursuing educational pursuits. And so our goal is just to do whatever we can do to save rural America. And, and, and some of our projects include even helping individuals get into housing and, and fix their homes. And so we have, we, we work, you know, daily and, and on a continuous basis to ensure families are getting what they need. One of our biggest projects right now is delinquent tax, the delinquent tax um, project. And that's just encouraging families to go up and pay up, pay on their taxes to avoid losing their land. And if you lose land, it, it, it's very hard to get it back. So that's pretty much one of our main goals right now. Thank you, Tanisio. Yes, indeed. Give thanks. Give thanks. Now, anyone who knows anything about agriculture in the Black community knows we'd be remiss if we did not have someone here from Tuskegee University, right? I mean, that would just be a huge oversight. But of course, we don't make those kind of oversights around here. We know what we're doing. And so we have the one and only Russell and Jewel Bean here, who, as I mentioned earlier, are not only farmers themselves with SB Farm, but they also do represent that great institute of Tuskegee University founded by Booker T. Washington. And so we're going to let them uh, introduce themselves real briefly here before we get into the depth of the discussion. So you all take it away. Go ahead, Jewel. Hello, everyone. I'm just so honored to be here and represent Tuskegee and SMB Farm. Uh, I am a resource specialist with Tuskegee University, and my background is food science and nutrition. Russell and I relocated back here when uh, my dad was uh, 96 and, of course, needed a little help at that time. And uh, as God would have it, we just end up staying here. We start meeting other farmers and volunteering the first five and a half years just to learn whatever we could, you know, learn and uh, gathering information night and day, 24 seven to put the farm back together. And we just got blessed to meet the right people at the right time. And that's how we were introduced to uh, Tuskegee and what all they were doing. And I guess you could say the rest is history. Yeah, it's like what Jewel said. Uh, I'm a resource specialist with Tuskegee University and dealing with small farmers and agriculture. And basically what I do is I point people to the resources that are available. There are a lot of resources that are available that farmers don't know about. And when we first came into farming, we went to these workshops, we traveled before we did anything, before we hit anything on the ground, deciding what we're gonna do, making a plan. And my philosophy is to dream big, think big, but start small. And the reason why is that so you don't get discouraged. Farming is not easy. As I'm originally from Dothan, I'm a little bit different. I, I like to hunt, I love to fish. And so actually as a, um, a teenager in, in, in school, I worked for this gentleman that had a horse farm, a big farm and gardening. So I did farming and gardening and, and all of that as a kid. And I didn't run away from it. I didn't have a negativity about it. So um, I would have worked for him for free just to fish in his ponds because I love the fish so much. And so I still continue with that and never thought that one day that I would actually be doing a lot of farming. I've always, we've always grown little small things, but not to, you know, to get into that. We wanted to retire back here. Of course, my wife did not want to come back. Like 
a lot of uh, country girls, you know, that go off. They don't want to go back to the country itself. Well, I've been all over. Jewel has been more. She was a professional model as well. I don't like the big cities. I like the small areas. I like the people when you're driving down and they wave at you. You know, when people move to the north and say, who's that waving at me? I don't know them. You know, both black or white down the neighborhood and helping folks that that genuine hospitality difference. Not saying that the North doesn't have that, they do, but I just uh, did, I, I just love the closeness within what we have and can strike up a conversation with someone. So that's what we do. And so I was fortunate to come back and I love my father-in-law and mother-in-law dearly. And so I, we were able to shut our house down and cause I'm a real estate appraiser, auctioneer, also I'm a paralegal in um, litigation and real estate as well. So a lot of things that I have and I was able to transport my business by having basically a home-based business to be able to do that. And it was a blessing for us. And so we're working with Tuskegee, working with people, and we're just doing it. And now if you Google us, we're all over like Mr. Taylor and some of the others, you know, you just all, you know, I find things on Google that I didn't even know about myself. So, <laughs> so that was basically it. We just love what we're doing. And, and it is, it's a passion because yeah. we love helping other people like Miss Sherrod and like Frank Taylor and all the rest of you. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have one other individual we'd like to uh, welcome into this discussion, that being the one and only uh, K. Rashid Nouri. As I mentioned, he founded Truly Living Well right here in the great city of Atlanta, Georgia, and he now runs the Nouri Group. Uh, Baba Rashid, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the viewers. Greetings, everybody. It's wonderful to be here with you today and to see some faces that I have not met before. I have this opportunity to, to interact and converse, meet you. My background, I'm a city boy. I was born in Boston many, many years ago. And um, how I got involved with agriculture, um, I was as a child of the 60s, we were talking nation building. If you want to build a nation, you got to be able to feed, clothe, and shelter your people. And uh, I had an experience where God told me to learn everything about food from seed to the table. Uh, and that rather than being a carpenter to build or a printer to print, because I was looking for a practical skill, I was given agriculture. So the path that I've taken for well over 50 years now has not been one that I really chose is what I was told to do. And uh, I don't understand how people can't do what God tells you to do. Uh, my work has taken me around the world. Um, I've been very blessed. There are a lot of people who had a, a greater uh, depth of experience and knowledge in any particular area, but very few have had the, the breadth of experience. Uh, I, first, I first came south in, in 1975, and I ran the Nation of Islam's farms. We had 13,000 acres spread across the south. Uh, 4,200 acres was in Turo County, right across the road from New Community. And white folks were so upset, had black people controlling over 10,000 acres of land down there, that didn't sit well. So they did their very best to, to get it, steal it, get it back. And I guess they've been very successful over in Lee County, the population now down to 15%. Uh, the nation uh, eventually lost all the land. My job there was to keep it from being stolen, given up free. Um, but I also worked with Father McKnight, over the uh, uh, Southern Cooperative Development Fund, working with farmers throughout the South, built a farm there, run a rose garden, 30,000 rose bushes. Um, I went to work for Cargill, spent 12 years there, ran the soybean processing plant up in North Georgia, Hall County. Um, I was in Asia, I worked in all the non-communist Asian countries. I opened business in Nigeria. Uh, I've worked in Ghana, I was at the Department of Agriculture. Shirley mentioned the ASCS. Uh, I was there, well, I was part of the group that changed the name to uh, FSA, Farm Service Agency. Um, so I've had a chance to see a, a whole lot um, studying local food economies around the world. It's how uh, most places, we used to live within walking distance of where our food is produced, that time doesn't exist. Uh, but I think it's necessary to come back to that. And I guess when we talk about the substance, I, I can get to that a little bit. I uh, came to Atlanta, 2006 from, I was in Ghana before that, came to Atlanta to start the Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture, where we trained uh, 
Uh, we grew food, we grew people, we grew community. We've trained a lot of folks and twice have uh, led the building of the two largest farms in, in uh, Atlanta. And now uh, Terry Living Wells owns its own land, um, which is the thing I find quite pleasing, satisfying. Uh, too many of us who are farming lose our land. You know, we had 18 million acres back in 1910. That's less than 2 million now. So to be able to acquire and have the, the largest farm in the city that's owned by a black organization uh, satisfies me very much. So I, I, I have some things to talk about how we can take this to the next level. As the brother said, uh, brother Russell, you know, you want to think global, but act local. And uh, so we talk about some of the things we've been doing locally. Yes, indeed. Give thanks. Give thanks. Now, this isn't a wedding, y'all, that y'all are attending, but I'm, I'm going to take on a wedding tradition. If y'all think that none of these people have the expertise to be able to speak, speak up now. All right, too late. It's over. So these are all the experts. We're going to let them do their thing because, I mean, I just know we're getting ready to take a deep dive. As I mentioned, we got four subjects, so we're going to try and get through all of them quick. We're going to talk about the politics, the legalities, the resources of owning land, and then we're going to take a deep dive into some new age politics. And so with that being said, I am going to kind of take this through a flow and an order, but any of you all as the panelists, please feel free to chime in. Uh, we're going to try and do about 10 minutes per subject. So let's just start right off with the political considerations. I'm Shirley, you had talked about it earlier. You know, there was a lot of uh, zeal that you all had about getting into this, this frame of mind that, you know, what we're going to do for self. As she had mentioned, the Nation of Islam has based its entire uh, focus on that but you all face some real opposition. Uh, let's just say that it's 2020 and you now wanna try and do something like this again, right? We know that there's an organization actually here in the Metro Atlanta area, a group of uh, individuals who have created what's now called Freedom Georgia. If you were in the shoes of a Freedom Georgia or someone like that, what are some of those political uh, considerations that you would want us to think about? Planning commissions, city councils, yes. you name it. Yes, and even being in touch with some of the local uh, Black people <laughs> so that they can understand what it is you're trying to do. And it wasn't that we didn't, we, we had canvassed and we had 500 families that wanted to, to move on the land. But you also had insurance agents out there, you know, back in those days, they'd go and collect those pennies and so forth from our people each week for very little insurance and they were doing a job on us trying to help them understand you know if you if you you wouldn't own any land you wouldn't own anything that's the way they put it you know we had arranged for people to have long-term renewable leases on the land that they would build a home on but ha having our people understand that so the, one of the keys is to make sure if you bought land in a county and you have these great dreams, you also need to see, you need to talk to some of the black people there so that they can understand because white people will use them to help fight you as well. And, uh, you know, we didn't, there wasn't a lack of planning on our part, but then you find that there's these regional commissions, there are all of these various organizations that can close rank to try to keep you from being successful at what you're trying to do. So, um, and I'm not saying let that, that stop you. Oh, no, no, no. Even when you lose 6,000 acres like we did, it didn't stop us. We have more property now and we are continuing to work. Um, I find it difficult though to, and it's just me, I just can't share everything because I don't know who's a friend and who's not. That's the other thing you have to get a handle on. You know, you have to be careful about who, who you share the entire plan with as you step in these muddy waters to try to come to some clear water to be able to, to swim on out. Um, you know, there's just so many pitfalls when you're moving into an area. And 
well, I grew up in this area. We were moving into Lee County, you know, but I'm from Baker County. And my father, when he was murdered, had been a borrower from at, with the Farmers Home Administration. And um, they, so there was a debt after he, after he um, passed and the, the FHA person uh, went to my mother's house and and he said things like, um, if your son-in-law can be up there trying to build a community in Lee County, why can't he pay off your, your debt with Farmer's Home? You know, we eventually did that, but you know, there were, I have four sisters. My mother was pregnant with my only brother when, um, when, when he was murdered. So there was no way we could continue the farm. But um, I mean, Lisa, I didn't mean to get off in that too, but um, just to, to warn you that it, it, it looks like you could have a clear path to go on and do, you bought some land and now you just, you know, this is your land. You can decide just what you want to do on it and you can go on and do it. It just doesn't happen that way. You got to plan for the, the things that will get in your way. You know, to really give that uh, some, some, uh, applicability even to situations I've seen recently. I, I know of some individuals who actually are, have a steering committee that they put together here in the metropolitan Atlanta area to create an actual city ag plan, right? So that they can get some intersectionality between the farmers, food distributors, urban gardeners, mm -hmm. you name it. And their first roadblock that they've been facing is when they went to present this plan to the, to the planning commission. Mm -hmm. And to your point, though this planning commission uh, doesn't have as much power as, let's say, the next stage, which is the city council, that planning commission, we've looked at the fact that if they put a bad mark on this and the city council still decides to go through with it, when you try to come back around to get some of your permits and your zoning, you have to face that very planning commission. Mm -hmm. so even though the mayor has approved it, city council has approved it, planning commission can say, hey, we denied this. You don't, for don't forget about us. And so That's to right. your point, to really befriend them, uh, not only on a political level, but even like you say, embracing the community could help to prove very well because I've seen it happen in real time. And to your point, mm -hmm. you hate to put in all of that work, right? Just to have someone spit in your face proverbially like that. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anyone else who wanted to chime in just on that particular area based upon some of your own experience, if you'd like to? Baba Rashid? Tanisio, Tanisio, I would also say uh, forming relationships. Uh, with yeah. even with the planning uh, department, getting to know who is who. And I know it's not always easy, but, um, you know, forming relationships uh, is important. But we know how the people think. And I would always say, be, be silent until you can say checkmate. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> add to that. Drop the mic the with that. Go ahead, Jessica. I think she was un, uh, muted there for a second. Okay, no problem. Thank you, guys. Um, Jessica Lewis. Um, speaking to the same thing, I'm one of the builders on the Freedom Georgia project. I'm also a developer myself. And a part of my strategies are actually I make friends first and enemies later. <laughs> and so um, I do do pre-planning meetings. So anything that we'll be doing, we have discussions with the politicians in that area, planning and zoning, code departments, everybody in advance. So they already know that this is what we're trying to do. So there is no surprises. We do have meetings with the communities there, having discussions as was mentioned on what we're looking to do and getting their input on the projects versus us saying, you know how us, we got our little ideas. We think it's the best thing since sliced bread. But if you didn't talk to the people where this idea is going to, the challenge is that they may not want it there. So as much as you want it yourself does not mean your neighbors want it. And so we have to be very cognizant on how we make decisions in our communities, because if you haven't really gotten the buy-in from the neighbors or from the powers that be, whomever they are, you may not be able to do your project successfully. And if so, you won't have a lot of roadblocks unnecessarily. So I, I totally agree with that. Thank y'all for sharing that because that's something we educate people on a lot. Yeah, thanks indeed. Well, I want to definitely make sure that we uh, take that uh, part of this discussion up to that next level, right, which is even some of the legalities that can come up once you've even acquired some of the land. 
And uh, Frank Tiari, I know you had already alluded to the taxes and, you know, let's just really dissect. Okay, you've purchased the land, you're ready to start doing some things with it, or you've had it even in the family, you know, and you're trying to figure out how do we, you know, reboot it, if you will. Uh, family land 2.0. You know, what are some of these legal considerations that people need to keep in mind when owning the land? I guess I'm up. <laughs> um, the most important thing is maintaining the taxes, paying your taxes, um, knowing um, the due date for the taxes. Um, we've had some issues where families have lost um, their land due to minimal minimal debts not paid. We actually work with a group called the SFLR Network. And that group is to help air property owners get their land settled. Um, we've been working with that group for the past, I believe, three years now. And families, they, they fail to realize that, you know, if you don't have a person in charge or if families don't make a, uh, make a state plan before that time comes, they put their land at risk for being lost forever. And so it's really important that the, the, main, the main person, you know, the main holder, take that time out to do that succession planning for the next generation to come. Can you talk about it uh, even when you see a timeline, let's just say, for example, uh, you know, the average person might only be familiar with the tax schedule for their personal taxes. Is that the exact same schedule for paying the taxes for the land? Are there the same type of rules that apply or is it something different? So the, the, the land tax, so the land tax is something where, for instance, in Mississippi, we have a land tax sale that is held the last Monday in um, August, a yearly. And an individual who may be in arrears, they have three years to be in arrears before their land is at risk of being sold to another entity. And so the goal is for you to try to pay that land. So say this year, we are in 2020. Those who were in arrears in 2017 were deemed to pay their land that um, in 2017 um, taxes so that when the um, land tax sale was taking place, that land was not at risk to be snatched away from the families. So the main thing is to ensure you have the right people on the list so they can receive the tax notice so that they're paying the taxes on time. That's the important part. And Tanisha, if I, if I can add, in the state of Georgia, and most, most individuals don't know this, and we try to make sure people understand that, you have a year to reclaim it. You, have, you just have to pay the person who purchased it and they make and a little interest on you know added to it, but you do have a year to get if your if your land is sold at a tax sale, you have a year to get it back. But most of our folk don't don't know that, and so that person ends up getting a clear deed to it after the year is over. But you know that's a great point because there's a uh, current documentary out this uh, released on a medium called Vice, and it mm -hmm. really shows a very concise you know, capturing of land. And I'm sure when people watch it, they'll see that there's this gentleman who's a developer who buys land, but mm -hmm. if they don't understand a scenario like you just described, all they see is the doom and gloom. Oh, mm -hmm. he won, right? But what you're saying is, no, there is still a statute of limitation in how long this person uh, has before they actually do officially acquire it. And let me ask you this, uh, for any of you all who, who have seen, you know, these people who all of a sudden just start nudging over the property line, right? You know, you, you might have a hundred and acres, hundred mm -hmm. acres, and all of a sudden you get your taxes in, this says 95. How do you deal with a situation like that? I mean, obviously, again, I'm, I'm using some very general scenarios, but what would be some first steps to maybe make sure that someone mm -hmm. who's trying to, you know, creep up on your property line uh, can be dealt with appropriately? So the one of the other things we do often is provide um, surveys on individuals' lands. And so having your land survey and marked is, is vital for um, th this particular situation that you're speaking of. So that when, it's, when the time does come, individuals can show on paper, legal paper, that this is my land, this is where it's marked, this, is not, this does not belong to this individual. That's mm -hmm. one way to fight that situation. 
We've had oh. people to, to uh, you know, if they fence in uh, a, a parcel of land and put their name on the on the gate, you know, then and the family doesn't challenge that after a period of time, they can they can. So I've I've advised families to take that name that name down, put yours up there, and take a picture of it, you know, so that you have that proof. But you know, you get these folks who who try to use all kind of ways to to take the land. I, I grew up in an area called Hawkins Town. They were all Hawkins, probably a total of about four thousand acres or more. When you looked at how they made sure each family unit bought land, and now you have this white guy who who makes no bones about the fact that he wants all of it. You know, so he's used different taxes to try to get some. He even uh, told my mother he wanted to swap out some land. So you tell her, even though the land is still on my mother's name, he said, you tell her I'll give her two acres for one. He had some property out by the highway. So my mother just insisted that I talk to him. So I drove down there one day. He had no intention of giving two acres to one. He thought he was dealing with a fool. He had gone to the courthouse. He brought all of the maps and everything. And I listened to him and I said, I'll let you know, that was about three years ago. I haven't talked to him since. But they 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 keep up with what's, they, they apparently that guy has someone in the courthouse who feeds information to him. And that's how we lose a lot of our land too, because we don't go there to check, to be sure. And we'll pay taxes and they own it. So Frank, I know you got something to say on this one. <laughs> well, go ahead. I, I do have some value that I want to add uh, to this uh, conversation. And uh, what is very important to me is being a landowner, but also uh, to ensure that other people in the community are aware of their rights. But what we do as an organization, and we do this from day to day and from minute to minute, to make sure that I know where all the land in Africa, I'm African American in Winston County, I know where families own land. Now, we know where the absentee landowners are. So, as TR alluded to a moment ago, we provide surveys to families. And we ask that if the absentee landowner that live in the other city to bring two or three generations with them to live Louisville, Mississippi, so we can show you where the markers are. Then at the same time, we take a, a T-post and we take a PCP piece, piece pipe and we place it on the ground so those individuals will be able to see it, whether it's in the fall or in the spring. We paint it either white or paint it orange to make sure that those landmarks are there. And sometimes you have to be bodacious with people. I'm just that guy. You have to let other people know that they cannot uh, take your property if you are mining that property. Mm -hmm. And you do have uh, some white owners in certain communities. They feel that they have the privilege to do that. But as an organization, we ensure on a day-to-day -day basis that we know where the land is located there in Winston mm -hmm. County. We uh, have a relationship with our tax assessors and the collector and the uh, other individuals there in the courthouse to make sure that we're getting the current information. As you go through with our uh, FSA, the first thing you need to do in, in order to get service, you have to provide a map. And so we work with the um, tax collector, the map there, and also the map there they have at FSA. But the one from uh, the tax collector office is the uh, one that supersedes the one at FSA. So again, it's just about connecting and working with groups of people. Yes, sir. Uh, Frank, uh, I wanted to ask Frank, Frank, do you go to uh, Bentonia, oh, Bentonia, okay. Mississippi, uh, to do any surveys? I have, we have land in, in Bentonia, 125 acres. Yes, you can give me a call. Yes, I'll, I'll talk I'll, with you. And just, just a reminder to everyone who, who's tuning in, we're going to take Q&A at the end to make sure that we can stay on, on time. It's perfectly fine. I know y'all are excited as well. So please make sure that you put the questions in the chat as they're, as they're going through. We are going to get to questions and we will open up the floor a little bit later on just so we can stay on, on time. Okay. I, I like Thank to interject you. briefly. Every yeah. state is different. In Alabama, you have three years that you can redeem your, your, your taxes at that particular time. I bought tax sales and I have some deeds as well. But you know, the, that's just, that's a whole nother issue that you can make money on as well. Uh, the other thing is that most states have conservation 
practice that you can put in and you can take the land out, say for instance, if you have a house mm -hmm. and 100 acres, you could take maybe uh, five acres and the rest of it goes into conservation and the taxes are a whole lot less. Like for instance, our taxes is only $108 on the major portion of the land, but then with the residents it's more. So they don't tell you that. And so most states have that. And the other thing is that um, uh, with um, the tax sales, a lot of people don't realize that they run it in the paper, they have it available. Sometimes people, they're running, people don't know about it. And then going into mm -hmm. the assessor's office, their job is that they send it to their tax, to the address of record. Mm -hmm. So people need to make sure that they go in. Also, the tax map, uh, it could be different from what the actual land that you own. So you, the only way you would do that, you have to get a survey. And when you get that survey, then you can take that survey and have it recorded at the courthouse. So the, the tax office might say that you may have 50 acres, but in actuality, you know that from your deeds and everything else, you only had, you really had 70 acres or 75 acres and can make that difference. And you have to do that. And Mr. Sherrod talked about it. You have to be due diligence, be there, know your land, be a hostile, let people know, because we had that issue as well. And I had to talk to my neighbor, send him a letter, let him know you need to move. He moved the he moved the stakes out there, the survey, and, and it's illegal to move stakes, but you get a lot of these people, they don't realize it. And I had this other guy go back and he, I put it back and you take it off and I put it back. And then I sent him a letter. Then, then he wanted to run his fence up to my fence. And I kept a distance between that so I could maintain about five feet on the other side of the fence so no one can attach to my fence. And I sent him a letter and said, please remove your fence within certain days. If you don't, I'm going to remove it so that you don't try, you try to eliminate getting yourself into court system if you can. And there are ways that you can do that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, you've already kind of started to dive into what the next focus area was going to be, uh, Mr. Bean, which is, you know, really some of these resource considerations. And as you talked about land that could be uh, converted, right, from, let's say, one designation, such as residential, into agriculture, we know that that comes with certain benefits. Uh, but talk about some of the other resource considerations. Let's say, for example, you know, you're a family and the last person who farmed the land was 1964. You know, now it's 50, 60 days, late years later, 2020. You know, what are some resources that people can consider leveraging to make getting the land back up to speed easy and then even continue on with some of those resources? Uh, what do you all, let's say, for example, advise farmers to do in your positions as resource specialists? Uh, your mic is uh, muted, Mr. Bean. Go ahead and unmute it. S repeat that again. Yes, sir. So ultimately, I'm just saying from you all's position, you and your wife as resource specialists, if you were to talk to landowners who either, let's say, are air property owners and they've just come into the realization that they have property, or even people who've had land that's just been sitting dormant and they knew about it, but they didn't know what to do with it. Let's talk about some of the resource considerations of owning that land that people can leverage, whether it be uh, federal dollars, you know, uh, uh, call share programs, you name it. Feel free oh, to share what you yes. all are familiar with. Yes, there are, lot, there are a lot of people that have land that may not, they it's just sitting still. It's not doing, they're not doing anything with it. And it could be producing. And there, there are a lot of things that people can do. They could, they could uh, lease out their property to someone. Um, they could lease it out for hunting. They could lease it out for uh, hay. It's if they have open fields, they can create for that. Or if they don't want to get into the, um, and they, if they want to keep their land organically, of course they have to have make sure they have uh, good agreements and know what the person is doing on their land if they're going to lease it, lease it so that they don't destroy your land as well. Uh, so you have to make sure that uh, one of the things is uh, mineral rights. People don't realize that they may have mineral rights, air rights. They may want to have towers depending on a certain area that they can't use. They could maybe put towers because that's happening in, in the rural areas. Uh, growing pecan uh, or, orchards that they can add into it. Pine straw is another thing too by doing forestry. Forestry is real big and in this long term, it's basically about 35 years that you get. So getting a forestry management plan in most states like ours, you can get a forestry management plan free mm -hmm. and it can come in and, and give you those plans and doing that so that you can maybe take out the scrub like we've done, taking out the scrub stuff, 
left the hardwoods, leaving the pines, and then going back and we're going to plant um, longleaf pines. And their NRCS programs will cover practically all of that, planting, the fire burn, the prescribed, all of those things. So people need to look at, you know what it is? You already have a seed in your hand. Mm -hmm. And most people don't realize that, have that seed and they can take from what they already have. And let's look at that plan. Yes. Now, now you, you threw an acronym out there and we're not going to assume everybody on here knows all the four letters and three letters that come with USDA programs in particular. Please explain what NRCS is to those who may not be familiar. Oh, the NRCS is your, is your uh, uh, National, Resource Conservation, National Service. Resource Conservation Service. Yes. Right. And kind of explain how someone would leverage that particular uh, program. Even though we can, we know that there's many of them out there, but you, you mentioned that one. Talk about how someone could take advantage of that. Uh, you can take advantage of those by first going to your FSA office, uh, getting a phone number, which, which is. Hold on, you threw another acronym out there. <laughs> FSA. What is FSA? <laughs> Uh, uh, you throw me off. Uh, uh, farm, farm service agency. I'll stop. I'll stop <laughs> farm, farm, farm service, service agency. 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 That is the. Uh, it has many. It has many roles. That's where people ought to get loans from. Farm loans. That's where they get uh, the micro loans that they have now available. You can get up to fifty thousand dollars. That's when they have certain programs like the CFAP program right now is going on with the COVID nineteen. There are funds that they will pay you for animals if you. If you're raising animals, pigs, cows, sheep, goats, so forth, or if you're growing certain um, uh, produce, there are funds that are still available for those that you can get those. Or uh, if you have a, if we have a um, storm that goes through, a lot of those funds are available. If they blow down, blows down um, uh, valuable trees, and you can go in and get um, um, dollars for those as, as well. And then the other thing is when you have a natural disaster or also when we have drought. So there are funds that's available on that side. One of the things that uh, um, Mr. Rod said, and which I all of a sudden is doing your due diligence. You have to do your due diligence. They're not gonna knock your doors down and say, we have this available, you have this stuff. I've called so many people, look, do you know about this program? It's available, you got a week to do it. You got two weeks to do it. You, got, you might have a day to do it. Get your stuff together, have your records together so you can do it, that's just the way it is. Well, and since you mentioned that, and this may be a, a somewhat of a bridge to, to Baba Rashi, but if anyone wants to chime in on it, feel free. You talk about going to actually get these services because no one's going to come knocking down your door. Uh, but what history has told us too is that sometimes they don't even record that they gave you the service or that they neglected to give you the service. Uh, is there something someone can do if they go to uh, one of these offices such as Farm Service Agency or Natural Resource Conservation Services to prove that they've gone in to solicit some service. Absolutely, and I'm glad you. At, that's a good question because we're still having issues today, even after the Pickford loan and having the problems with that. We still have offices that are having that problem. Well, I know my DC. I know who is over in Alabama, Ben Malone. You can go onto the websites and you sign up use under um, farmers.gov. And so you can go in and sign up for that, know where you are, what's going on, and you ask for a receipt of service right. so that they can do that. And what I've, I, I've told the people at NRCS and the big heads is this, why don't you make it a mandate that they have to do it automatically? How would I know to ask you for a re receipt of service if I've never heard of it? I said, so you should mandate that mm -hmm. automatically. I said, it seems to me that you all are still putting a stumbling block in. I said, I'm not gonna stop harping on that. It should be a mandate that it is done. So we had someone that went through about three years, veteran, try to get these services and different things, but turn down, turn down. I said, go in and ask for a receipt of service, go in and do for these things. And all of a sudden he called me back, Mr. Bean, all those things that he said I wouldn't uh, uh, qualify for, I'm qualified for it now because they begin mm -hmm. to know, oh, maybe this person know a little bit of something. Doing your due diligence, getting that information for yourself. Mm, thank you. And and I just thought before I make this transition to, to Baba Rashid, I do want to bring Mrs. Bean in to really talk about uh, some of the experience you've had, uh, not only in, in maybe some creative ways to use the land to even complement some of the ideas that Mr. Bean had talked about. He said to me that you're the you're an expert. I'm I'm putting some pressure oh, on you. Wow. 
okay. on, on agro-tourism. Yeah, I just give, I give God all the praise and glory because <laughs> I tell you, when I got here, everybody was saying, oh my goodness, what can she do? All French manicure and big ponytail and half hair. And I mean, I had to just change my game plan. I said, okay, it's time to get some cowgirl boots and big hats and all. And I did, and I just had, you know, people to show me with experience. So I found out that the ladies that had been growing like fruit trees and all, we gather together and do like a pick and pay. And we have people all at Tuskegee, different areas that run um, blueberry farms and they do a pick and pay. So. We talked to our ladies, homeowners and farmers and growers that could take that fruit and make different uh, jars of jams and jellies. And it's doing what our parents did and our grandparents and so forth and so on, how they utilize the land to get the things that they needed on the farm and you just make it happen. And that's where agritourism come in now so strong is when you take the regular ag industry and you mix it with tourism and it just come together for people. It's allowing people to see what you're passionate about, where your calling is, and bringing them into it to make the world a better place. Because we all here for a purpose. We have something to offer. And if you would just allow God to use you and show you where you stand and what you have to offer, it'll just happen for other people. So you are a blessing here to bless others because we all know it's not about us, okay? So that's what we've learned to do. And in sharing this, I found out with the farmers, the growers, as well as a lot of people that own ranches, that they could make money just doing barbecue different times of the year. Matter of fact, I've had different farmers and growers to just bring people in the gardeners and all, growing flowers, growing herbs, like the medicinal herbs, which I grow, hibiscus, sorrel, as well as moringa. And they grow up to be huge trees, but it's so much healing in those trees. I mean, you can just take those different herbs and help with uh, sugar diabetes, help with cholesterol, help with blood pressure, all this. Uh, people that's dealing with uh, fibromyalgia, they have a lot of joint plane arthritis. So all this I've been teaching here on the farm. We have the classes set up. And Russell and I've been doing the classes now for what, about a decade off and on. Mm -hmm. And because of COVID, of course, we're doing it all now through Zoom and Skype, but we're still working it. And people are ordering seeds and so forth. So all these things we're teaching people. This time of year, I have farmers doing the, um, the uh, what they call the pumpkin patch. And they're selling the pumpkins, they have the hay rise, they're doing the big flowers like the sunflowers. So it's just so many ways you can make money, whether you're selling buckets of pecans, allowing the people again to come in, pick and pay. There's so many ways to make money. So you just have to use your mind, use the brain God has given us and just stretch your imagination. And a lot of people are doing the Airbnb. We're going to later set up for that. People will pay you to come in, pick their eggs fresh. I'm serious. They're paying for it on the weekend. Come prepare their eggs themselves. Pick a little arugula, a little spinach, a little broccoli, uh, basil, whatever you're growing, parsley. All this I grow on my phone because the herbs are really easy to grow. And they are actually pay paying for this $2,500 per person for two to three days on the weekend. It's all over the web. That's the hottest new thing now is agritourism. And I love it and I want some of it. <laughs> so we're going to go get it and I'm sharing it with a lot of the ladies and they're so excited. <laughs> Indeed. Well, give thanks for sharing all of those very wonderful ideas. And uh, I know we've only got about uh, at least 10 minutes left in this section before we go into Q&A. So I do want to welcome into the discussion Baba Rashid Nouri. I know you've implemented a lot of these things that people have mentioned in, in Truly Living Well uh, here in Atlanta. The agritourism factor is definitely there. Uh, just being able to keep in mind the political game that we're up against, the legal considerations. And yet with all of that taken into play, right, we know that there's still this one entity, you know, they call Big Brother, as they say, that uh, has shown in history that they can also do some things. Now, before I let you speak on some of the things they can do, what I do want to prompt people on is the idea of also looking at these periods in time, such as what we're in now, right, elections. And this is actually not going to be a go out and vote statement. What this is going to be is really saying, okay, how do we 
groom up the people in our community to take on some of those positions. And Baba Rashid, I know you had that opportunity to work in the USDA and really champion uh, for the people uh, a cause in the case of where the Pickford lawsuit leveraged much of the information that you had to help gather as a deputy. So I'm putting that out there first to then say, talk about what are some of the ways that we the people, if we get into some of those positions, can help bring forth some policies and talk about some historical examples of how we could uh, do some of those same things in this day and time. Well, thank you, Tanisha, as well stated. Yeah, first, first I, it's just so wonderful to hear all these veterans, seasoned veterans in the ag field talking and passing on this knowledge. And I think one of the important things is for these young people, uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to. And none of this new, we've been here before. Uh, awesome. We've made a lot of mistakes. What I tell people all the time, I'm gonna give you the time and space to learn from your mistakes, but you can save some time and learn from mine if you listen. Uh, and I think that's, that, that's, that's important. The history, you know, America is, is, the United States is the richest agricultural producing region in the entire history of the world. And, and it's an amazing thing to think about it. I mean, all the human beings that have been here no, and, and the uh, uh, political organizations that uh, structures that have been created, all the nation states, none has produced as much food um, as the United States. And how did we get there? Well, there are, there are four thing, four elements to it. The United States declared in, in 1862, within 48 days, there were four things, bills that were passed that made, uh, <laughs> to borrow a phrase, from, uh, made America great. Uh, <laughs> look at Ray. Let, let that hang for a second. <laughs> it's about the universe. <laughs> yeah. So the first thing is that the the Department of Agriculture was was uh, established. That was the first um, uh, subject matter department in government. Today we got health, education, transportation, energy, labor, all these different subject matters to help the American people. But it didn't exist in 1862 when it was established. So that was for the, uh, a commitment by the Congress of the United States to the people of the United States saying that agriculture is important to us and important to our development. Um, and then second was, was land. Uh, they had the Homestead Act. Land was given to people, primarily Europeans came into mid-America uh, to grow food. They were paid to come in here and grow food, given land. Um, and that to, 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 to build on the agriculture. Third was the land grant colleges was established through the Morrill Act and all of these things that have been several aspects, several different iterations of these bills. But the Morrill Act established the land grant colleges. One of the things people don't understand um, is that big ag, capitalist ag is, is subsidized through every aspect of it. We find the Department of Agriculture hands out money. The land grant colleges do all the research. Let me give you an example. When I started in this business so many years ago, it took 12 to 14 weeks to grow a broiler. Now you get them in six. How that, how, who did that work? Purdue, Tyson, those big chicken companies don't do their research. It's done at the land grant colleges in the state. Then they pass that information on to the farmers they can implement in the field. Um, that's why they can, get a chicken to grow twice as fast, get it to you. I mean, you know, and they're doing all the hormones and chemicals and all the other negative things that are added to it. But the research for how to do that comes out of the university. The taxpayers pay for it. Uh, the labor in building this country, uh, also that land grant, the Homestead Act, um, displaced Native Americans. That was part of the genocidal process that took place. I don't, don't want to forget that. Um, uh, labor, this, you know, land, labor, and capital are the three things that you need to, to build a nation. Uh, this country had free land, had free labor, and ironically, the enslaved Black people were the capital. We were what made America wealthy. Uh, you could, they could take, go to the bank, one of the white plantation owners, could go to the bank with, and show his papers on the slave, his slaves and raise money, capital, in order to build his farms. 
Um, it's insidious, but that's that's how this country got to be where it is. Um, so what I'm suggesting, I would like to see a new, um, the, and, and the, the Railroad Act was the fourth act. That's how they, they, they were building the Transcontinental Railway. Um, that was a real fiasco. They got a mile on the east side of the track the railroad companies did, and all they had to do is send, send the bill um, to the Congress, and they paid them. So they stole a lot of money, but they did get it built, and that's how the, they had to get the equipment from the east. They used the Chinese with the principal work laborers to, to do that work. Um, so I don't want anyone to misunderstand, even though I'm using the language of, of the Homestead Act and some of the, 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 the um, bills that were put in place to build the agricultural sector, there are things that we can draw from that. And this is indeed, this is the big picture. You know, where's the land gonna come from? Um, we need to, you know, we used to have 18 million acres of land in 1910, now it's less than two. Where'd that land go? It was stolen from us. Henry Ford paid $5 a day and got so many black people to come from the South to go up North and work in them factories and make that $5, which was looked upon as being good money. Thank God there's a, these days people are coming back to the South and trying to uh, regain a, 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 what's the word I want? The migration is reverse, reverse migration. I was in Mississippi yesterday over Mississippi, Miss, East Mississippi near Columbus uh, family has 100 acres over there and they sold the timber off that land without even seeing it. Uh, they got ripped so bad. I mean, they th I think they got a third of the value of the timber that they had, but now they're trying to recapture it. So many of the things that you're talking about is information that they, they need to have doing the due diligence as, as, as Brother Bean said, knowing where you can go to get the information. And I think that was one of the things that we were able to help with when during my time at the department, I worked for Mike Espy, who now runs the Senator from Mississippi. And the uh, change in the county system, so some black people could have some voice on the county committees, which, which controlled where, how those resources were distributed, who got them. Um, so things have changed in many ways, but in a lot of ways, they still remain the same. When I came down to the nation's farm, said if I had nobody out there that could tell me what where I could go to get help, get the resources. And they certainly weren't gonna volunteer this information. Uh, one of the reasons they, after Mike left, one of the reasons they chased me out of the Department of Agriculture, I end, ended up going over to Commerce, is cause if I found something out that was helpful to us, I shared that knowledge and information. And that's the worst thing I could have done uh, cause they said I was too controversial. So you got to go. Um, but the millions and millions of dollars that go to the big ag companies, okay? We don't know that stuff. They don't tell us. And that nothing comes. Here in these last couple of years, the Trump administration has given a, I don't have the exact number, but at least $100 billion has gone to support big ag. My, my, my uh, uh, mandate for the last many years has been working with the urban area. They got $3 million that I know of that came out of this administration is directed specifically to urban agriculture. 100 billion or three, you know, we ought to be get 10, 15 billion that can go to small farms and urban agriculture. And most of us, most black people have small farms. Uh, and how are we gonna do that? So we need to have access to land, labor, and we certainly need the capital, both physical and financial to be able to, to, to develop this work. Uh, to continue this work. Um, and I think that uh, there, there are many ways the land can, we can get more land by low cost, long-term leases of idle land for production and education, offer land patents, create conservation easements. Brother talked about, talked about that. Uh, we also need to build and or convert housing for farmers. Because a lot of the young people that, that, that we've come through our program, Tenicio's one, Tenicio worked for two living well, um, they, there's no, you, you can give them land, but if they have to travel 15 miles to get to go work that piece of land, it makes no sense. We got to put house, so all the issues, housing, water, electricity, these are all part of the, of the work that needs to be done, be connected with the land. The labor, we need to have more training for these young people. I mean, you got down south, you got the, it was Abraham Baldwin College there, Tuskegee, uh, uh, Fort Valley, uh, teaching folk. But where are they going to go when they get out of there? We got to have the land for them. We can develop it. I'd like to see high school and technical school training partnerships. Uh, 
partnerships with local urban agriculture educators and, and advocating for organic agriculture training at the Georgia universities. We need to see more of this happen. In the capital, I mean, they, there's no, re they, they, we, you, here's one for you. I often had complaints at the farmer's markets. How come your prices are higher than that you're gonna get over at Kroger, Publix up here in Atlanta and uh, Lion, all of those stores down there. It's because the food, so much of what comes from California is subsidized. The transportation is subsidized. And most people don't know that California has no water. That's a mind blow. That money, the water to grow that food out there is, is paid for by the taxpayers. You and I support the production of the food in California that comes to us. That doesn't make any sense. This is why I think the local food economy is so important that we need to grow food where we are. Uh, and we have that opportunity. So, you know, we splashed tax funds, utility surcharges, uh, tax benefits for landowners that could, who are converting their grass into food. Uh, these are some of the ways that money can be raised, but this has to come through a commitment from uh, the local governments, local people that said, we, we believe that, that converting our agricultural system to uh, a local food economy is very important because the fact of the matter is big ag system is broke. That food that, that most of us eat is making us sick, it's killing us. Uh, and we don't understand why it's because of all like, the technology. I, I, I promoting, advocating a pre-industrial restorative agricultural system is what we need to put in place. And that's gonna take money to get that done in time. Uh, so, you know, it's partnerships with local banks and community development sorts to, to, to do this. And on the farms themselves, infrastructure needs to be put in place. Here in the cities and urban areas, irrigation meters, wells, farm equipment, input supplies such as seed and compost, breeding stock. There is no reason this was done to build the agricultural sector of this country as a whole. We need to revive that and look at some of these modes to be able to revitalize agriculture, small farms, urban agriculture. And I grant you, this is, this is in the future. I think what we saw with this, this pandemic and confinement has had many benefits. It's been stressful for everybody, but I see some benefits. I, I, in March, when the confinement first began, you see those big farmers plowing food into the ground? That make no sense to me. They're taking food and turn it in the ground because they didn't have the resources to get it from the countryside uh, across the country here to, into, the, into the city. So they figured it out. The uh, department at Sunny Purdue, who runs the Department of Agriculture, good old Georgia boy, uh, paid those big folks, put them, gave them the money so they can get the farms all of these food boxes that are being distributed. And it's wonderful. They're getting, feeding people, people getting food who did not have it before. But uh, if you teach, if you give a man a fish, he's going to eat for the day. Yeah, if you teach him to fish, he's going to be able to eat forever. So some of the things that I'm suggesting that this, this, and this is the, the a global view, uh, I think can benefit. It's, it's going to happen in the long term. Uh, it's going to take a while to do it. Thing that I find very satisfactory, like I said, I've been in this business for well over 50 years. To see from whence we have come to where we are today, there's been a tremendous amount of progress. But I am happy that the young people who are now involved in this work are anxious to get it done and see more happen. And that can be done. That can be done, and I hope that some of these young people will turn to us senior citizens. Uh, and let us help you. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm not. There's not that many wheelbarrows I'm going to be pushing anymore. Uh, but I certainly can uh, help some of the younger people if they want to listen, uh, to give advice and counsel. And that's why I'm so happy to hear all you folks that we're talking today who have been around for a while and doing this work. So that's the five minute version. <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting is that even with that much of a, of a condensed version, some of us still got to got to hear it from from the man, as they say. Right. So I just want to show you how forward thinking you are, Bob. But for those of you who have never heard of this book, this is called Harvesting Opportunity. And it says the power of regional food system investments to transform communities. Now, that's a cute title. But let's look at who actually is authors authored that book. The Federal Reserve, right? So with all that being said, almost every idea that you mentioned to the T is in this book. And this was released in 2018. 
you know, it, it has me think about some of the programs like the free breakfast program that came out of the Black Panthers that eventually became a U.S. program or the George Washington, uh, excuse me, the Booker T. Washington Mobile School on Wheels, right? The old Jessup wagon that eventually led way to the cooperative uh, uh, extension service, right? A lot of these ideas, right, that come out of our community, they do oftentimes get adopted uh, by the system. And so why I prefaced even bringing you in with, you know, us looking at grooming up some of our own leaders is so that we can still maintain control over those systems if and when they do make it up into government. Whoever uh, controls your food controls you. There you go, whoever controls your food controls you. <clears throat> Here we are in the state of Georgia, just speaking about the situation that we had occur uh, during our last government uh, governor's election. You know, many people heard about the uh, campaign of Stacey Abrams. You know, she created a lot of both uh, statewide buzz as well as national buzz. What a lot of people didn't stop and look at though, were what were the different uh, departments and areas that were along the ticket that people would just vote straight down the ticket on and thus see some positions. One of those positions was the secretary of ag or commissioner of ag for the state of Georgia, which would have been uh, Mr. Gary Black's position. And you had a gentleman who was originally running for a senatorial position, but he wasn't getting a lot of traction in that campaign. So he switched over and had his name placed on the ballot for commissioner of agriculture. No uh, agricultural experience whatsoever. He didn't know a thing about agriculture, but because people voted straight down the ticket for Stacey Abrams, this man almost won that position. And it just makes me think about if we were to take time to actually groom up some of our people who truly are qualified and have the history, have the know-how, have the grassroots connections, if something like that were to happen again, or even if we just build a real campaign around these uh, individuals, could we actually see some of these positions and do some real work? Um, I think we could take some of these ideas that you've mentioned and put into effect, and then begin to take on all the ancillary work that the entire panel has talked about uh, with a lot less headache. Now, by no means are any of us naive, we know this is gonna be warfare no matter what. We're always gonna be in the fight. But uh, I just appreciate that level of depth that, that you've given to this, Barbara Rashid. I think it's very important. And with that being said, uh, I wanna give thanks. Raina has blessed us with a small amount of extra time just to dialogue a little bit longer. So let's give it up. Thank you, Raina. And with that said, I just wanna kind of open up the floor. You know, I know none of these subjects yeah. are gonna just be able to be unpacked completely. So please, let's first and foremost start with this. Going in order, Mama Shirley, how can people contact your organization in case they need to speak with you? We're gonna do that with everybody and then we're gonna just kind of open it up for a broad discussion. And, and I, I would like to add that that information is already in their bios underneath yeah. this, 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 uh, this screen that they're in too, so they can message her directly. So Got if you it. miss it, don't ask her to repeat it. It's already in there, but she'll state it and everyone else. Unmute your mic, Mama Shirley. In fact, uh, let me see if I can do it. I think you'll have to do it. That's Shirley M. Sherrod at gmail.com, 229-430-9870. Sherrod is S-H-E-R-R-O-D, correct? Yeah, double R. Uh, Frank Tiari, T. can you both give some information for the people, please? T. All right, so um, fltaylor at bellsouth.net. That is Frank's email. His phone number is 601-291-2704. My cell number is 662-446-2423. My email address is a little, it's a tongue twister. So I'm gonna give you an alternative one and that's T-A-R-I-E. LT at Gmail. All right. The beans, go right ahead. It's our first initial, um, R and J for Jewel, and then our last name, Bean, like the vegetable. See, we were born for this. My name is Bean, B-E-A-N. <laughs> so it's R Bean and J Bean at tuskegee.edu. So separate this is different. So rbean at tuskegee.edu and then jbean at tuskegee.edu 334-687-2532. Go 
Terrific. Thank you. And Baba Rashid, go right ahead. Yeah, Rashid, R-A-S-H-I-D, at The Nuri Group. N is in Nancy, U-R-I, at the Nuri Group .com. My phone number is 404-520-8331. And if I can do anything to help anybody, just give me a holler. Sure. Well, let's start off at least with a couple of questions from the uh, viewers here. Let me look through them here one second. You, you may want to do some, if they want to open the mics, Tenisio, because then you can come back to those later. I'm, okay. I'm, look, you're the moderator. I'm just giving you suggestions because we have Hoover. But oh, you no. do make, what make moves you. I, I appreciate it. Okay. Can I speak? I'll start off with this question. I have, I have um, by the name of Erica. Uh, and if Erica, if you're here, you can uh, address this question directly. You had asked about these strategies in an urban context. So if you're there, could you talk about which strategies you were referring to specifically? Yeah, so at the beginning, you all were talking about um, strategies in a rural context that were, um, have been implemented in Mississippi. And I know that as urban ag is growing, my question was just, can some of those strategies be used in an urban context also um, I asked a couple of questions, if I could just put them all out there so you, you wouldn't have to go back and forth. The other one was around, um, there's a growing number of young heirs who are inheriting land from baby boomer parents who are dying from cancer. We can talk about the environmental health aspect that are wiping out this middle section. I'm a full-time caregiver of a 93-year-old grandmother. Lost my mother 24 years ago. My ma, grandmother has a house in Dalton. We have homes that we're trying to hold on in this urban context where some of them move a little further into the city, Dalton to Atlanta, right? And how can we leverage ag in this moment of urban ag to help us where there are no programs because we're not 65 and over. We're still inheriting homes that need to be fixed up um, and can ag potentially be a solution. So just, I think that there's a not an either or, but an and in both. And how can we leverage both urban and rural agricultural techniques to sustain? Uh oh, her, her mic went muted. I think uh, she gave the, the depth of the questions. Oh, uh, would anyone like to take a stab at that? Well, she, you're, you're the urban agrarian, so yeah, yeah, yeah. touch on the urban agriculture. That has been the, the, the focus of my work, has been the urban area and many of the things that I've talked about already do apply to the urban area. This work ha can be done. Uh, if you consider the fact that 82% that of Americans live in urban areas. So I think that, that it, and there's an opportunity here in the state of Georgia, I mean, make it clear, I, we have so many folks who are doing the rural work. We, there has to be a collaboration and cooperation between the urban and the rural. We cannot grow meats and grains in the rural areas. Here in Atlanta, being the greenest city in, in America by virtue of trees and open space, we can grow all the fruits and vegetables are necessary. But if you're a meat eater, you're not, you can't grow enough chickens to feed air, but you can do enough chickens to feed your family. But certainly not cows and sheep and um, uh, wheat and oats. Those things are gonna have to be done in the rural area. So the things we, we the land in the city needs to be reclaimed. There's, there's the land that's here. But all the support works, the things I talked about, the land and labor and the capital that, and the commitment, most of all, uh, that can be generated to promote agriculture in the urban areas and as well as in the rural areas, it can be done. And if you have a specific issue, just give me a call and I'll be glad to help you. Most definitely, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Bean. Uh, one of the things too, we, we didn't touch on rural development. There's a lot of things in uh, that's available in rural development. There are uh, loans that are available. There are, uh, there are renovation uh, funds that are available as well for the elderly. Uh, there are some circumstances, I'm gonna go there, but there are monies available. And I wanna, I wanna make this controversial, probably maybe, maybe controversial, not controversial. There has never been a shortage of money, and there will never be a shortage of money. Now, let me preface that. It is who has the money. You have to go find the money, okay? That's what, what I mean about it. And like Ms. Shirley said, 
not giving up. There are challenges there and there are always going to be challenges. We have to stop making excuses and go for it and do your due diligence. And we have, and we are emotional people and there's nothing wrong with that. But we have to deal with facts and figures and numbers because that doesn't change when it comes to this and part of being business. And that's what I try to get people to understand. That's why some people don't want to go to FSA and they don't want to go back to NRCS because they were treated bad. But you need to keep going back and not give up. Keep going back and you'll get those things. So you cannot give up. You just find another way, get with the right people, get with the resources. The money is there. There's over $400 billion of COVID money that's still available. And it's not being used right now because the money is given to the states and the states administer it. There was $120 million that was in Alabama. They only spent 90 million of it. I said, where's the other 30 million? I met the representative, he wanted to run out on me. I said, why don't y'all come back? Why did y'all do this just a week? Well, we're gonna have a, a, a whole inundated number of people. So we only did it a week. I said, that's not enough time when people know about it. What are y'all gonna do with this other money? Well, if we don't spend the money, it has to go back to the federal government by, uh, you know, if it's not spent by December 31st. So what I'm telling you, the money is there. We have to find it. We have to go look for it. Google it. Put in a Google alert about COVID funds and monies, and you get those Google alerts. And that's all over the United States. The money is there. Yeah, you know. Mama Shirley, you look like you. Yeah, you I just, I just, I'm so happy he brought rural development in. You know, that's I'm, for 11 months. I didn't get to do the whole uh, first uh, part of Obama's um, his first four years, but there, he's right. There's so much money there for value added producer. Uh, they value added producer grants for farmers. You you know you have to participate in having some money for that. But then housing, I just have to say this because the state of Georgia was send so much money back every year. There is no reason in the world our people should be living in poor houses in the rural area because mm. you can buy the land, dig the well, put in a cesspool, build a house, and all of those costs can be folded into the cost of the loan and then the payments are dependent on income. And that can change. If you have high medical bills, that can help bring the payment down, you know, from year to year. So anyway, I just, I wanted to be sure to say that. Um, I wanted to speak on the young lady's question. Oh, I think she was looking for resources that isn't necessarily for designed for people our age, her age, my age. Um, but there is a program through the federal home loan you could apply. It's called the, give me just one second, it's Special Needs Assistant Program. And they pull out an application every year um, in January. But you will have to find a bank that participate in this particular program in order for you to go through the process. So there's some, some private you know, um, resources that you can look into that may be able to assist your needs. Thank uh, you. Okay, um, you couldn't, you couldn't, oh, yeah. you had to do some work even while you were on the panel. I love it. I love it. And that's what we're talking about. We, we really have some very powerful people online who can get you answers that you need. Uh, with that said, I'm gonna open this up for maybe just one more question from the okay. list. I'll be on the- I would uh, like to ask a question uh, about adverse possession. Oh, okay, hold on one second. Hold on. I'm, I'm going to just look at the list here and then I'll call right. you. Yep. In fact, I'll do that. Jenna, I, I see you, you. That might be you speaking. You were wanting to ask about adverse possession, correct? Yes, I didn't hear anyone speak about that, but that's another way that land can be taken from you. Adverse possession. Well, and I'll say this much just to start off to answer that question. That is somewhat of what we were addressing when we talked about those those lines, right, being creeped up on right. 100 acres and someone now all of a sudden tries to take five of it. There's a period of time in which they can exist on that land, coupled with some of these uh, tax uh, acquisition strategies, if you will, that had been talked about. So just know that the real thing about adverse possession is how long the person that has basically stolen your land has been sitting on that land. So you want to make sure you pay very close attention to what your state says about adverse possession. In general, most states talk about seven years. Uh, in some states, they'll even go as far as 20. 
Uh, but that's my general knowledge of it. If any of the panelists would like to unpack it even deeper, feel free. Uh, but that is kind of what we were discussing earlier. Uh, in fact, Mr. Bean, I know you, you've got some real estate experience. Do you have anything you want to offer related to adverse possession? Not really. You covered it because you have to go by state and you just have to be, main thing is be aware, know what's going on, ride your property lines, go around your property lines, especially if you have a big track. Somebody could have cut your timber on the backside <laughs> and don't know about it. And timber gets cut all the time with people doing that. And with forestry, know who the heck you're dealing with in forestry. And because if you don't, you will get cleaned out. Right. Gotcha. And I, I want to do this as, as the moderator. I guess I get this luxury, right? I want to close out with one last question. And it's because this young man taught me this when I was at the Southern uh, University Leadership uh, Institute. And that's Mr. Frank Taylor. That's right. I'm, I'm talking to you, Mr. Taylor. You, you, you came to me one day while I was in the Institute. And you just asked a question like, so tell me what's going on today economically. Tell me what's going on today politically. Tell me about what's happening right now. And you tied that into what was going on in the agricultural sector. And you made it clear that if you don't keep up with what's going on, you might miss a lot. So it's, uh, what's today's day? Today is the 25th Sunday, 2020. What did we need to know about this week or going into next week uh, that could be very important for us uh, as we do this work in agriculture? I have well, something to say. Go ahead. Well, the, the most important thing is being aware of, of how the political system is being shaped in your communities. Uh, we're prepared for a, a national election. We have local election and we have election within election that's going on. So in your own world where you live, you need to know who the policymakers are. How can you change those policymakers? How can you put your input in order to change the area where you live? Oh, well, I hear interviews talking about living in the rural or living in the urban center. When I think about developing a community in my area, I look, well, who do I have to go and get permission from? I don't have to get permission from anyone. If I can generate my income, I can build a house, I can build a store, I can build whatever I want in my community because there are no set rules by our local government at this point in time. So if they do set rules, I'll be able to grandfather in. But as of today, if I want to build 20 houses on 20 acres, I can build those 20 houses without any regulation from government there in Winston County. So understanding where the political environment is, that's how you uh, determine that. Knowing what your interest rate are, who holds the money, how do you get the money, right? That's very important. All those things are important to me on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and I hate to do this because I know we got a lot of questions. There's a lot of interest, y'all. You ain't got to go home, but we're getting ready to wrap up. So I do want to emphasize, uh, it has been expressed to me that uh, if you have any questions, in fact, Raina, maybe you could explain this better. For anyone who still has questions, how can we make sure that those questions can uh, hopefully get answered? Yes, what a full panel. Beautiful, beautiful job. Great moderation. Mo, mo, mo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Give thanks all those praises. Amen. I say all of that. This is great. Um, I, um, if you all have questions, if you have maximized the view of your screen and you see this screen very large, if you can minimize it right now, I'm going to walk you through it. You should be able to see at the bottom of your screen uh, the direct messages for each one of our panelists. And matter of fact, let me let me use technology to my advantage. This is what you would see, the smaller screen. Over to the far right, you see session Q&A. People have been putting questions in here for each of you panelists. We have question upon question upon question for you all. So we will make sure that you all can answer these questions and provide that from your own perspectives. We also have things in the chat. People praise God for the knowledge drop. They're clapping their hands and everything. You all have definitely, definitely been a blessing to us. There's a proverb that says when an elder transitions or dies, an entire library burns down. You all are not transitioning anytime soon. We have you here and we are going to continue to use you as a resource. And to that same, same vein, if you want to contact any of them individually, scroll down and you'll see their, their picture and view their bio, send a message. Message, bio, message, bio, message, bio, all of that. You have the opportunity. If they don't have an email address there, just yet, don't you worry, I'm going to fix it. 
before we end off of this call so you all can reach out to them directly. Um, please do so and read more about them and continue to learn and grow. And if you all would join me in unmuting your microphones and telling them uh, thank you, expressing your gratitude, now would be the perfect time. Thank you so much. Thank much you. Love. Thank, you. thank you so much. Praise God. Ooh, ooh. We'll give thanks, Raina, for hosting us again. It has been a pleasure, you all. Thank you for having me as your moderator, your curator. And uh, just stay tuned. We got some more awesome uh, activities still happening. The conference ain't over, so make sure you tune into the rest of the summit. Uh, but until then, hey, let's get these hands in the dirt, get them dirty, you know, and let's make it happen, y'all. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Bro. Thank you all. Great, great. Thank you. Had a great time, man. Okay. <laughs> great. Stay healthy. Say, build that immune system. Earth is the